How y'all doing out there? Has anyone been to Nashville before? I have to say, I'm personally very excited about the move. I'm pretty sure Nashville is going to be the Bitcoin capital of the world. I know Jack knows I put a little bit of effort into that. So we're up here to talk about hyper-Bitcoinization. We're up here to talk about why we're bullish on Bitcoin. I know personally, Bitcoin is a, it's a tech project, right? It's an open source project, it's code. But it's easy to get lost in that. To me, the most bullish part about Bitcoin is the individuals that make it happen. It's a movement of individuals whether that's strong grassroots local Bitcoin communities, like we're seeing in Nashville and other places in the world, whether that's the open source contributors, which we were very proud to support here at the conference with the open source stage and the open source contributor ticket program. We gave over 150 tickets to open source contributors. And while I'm on that topic, I just wanted to do a huge shout out to Jack Dorsey, who gave $10 million to OpenSats. <laughs> or whether that's the founders that help build the companies that help push the Bitcoin network forward and make it more robust. And I'm very fortunate to be joined by two of our great founders here. We have Adam Back from Blockstream. And we have Jack Maulers from Strike. So guys, I mean, I don't know how many of you were here in Miami last year, but it's been a long year. It's been a long year. There's been a lot of rug pulls. I hope not too many of you lost your money on FTX or BlockFi or Celsius or Silicon Valley Bank, or Signature Bank, or Silvergate Bank, or First Republic Bank. <laughs> Hopefully not too many more banks before Nashville next year. But we were talking a little bit. And Bitcoin is scarce. Bitcoin is scarce. If you don't hold your own keys, what kind of situation are you in? You're in a situation where you might not hold Bitcoin. So Adam, let's start with that as a topic point. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, Bitcoin is interesting to many people for many reasons, but one of the differentiated properties of it is that it's unseasoned and bearer and gives you, you know, optionality and self-sovereignty. And as people get more immersed into Bitcoin, they, they tend to find that a pretty exciting and novel uh, key part of Bitcoin and so one of the you know there's there are all these different metrics posted online these days and one that scrolled past that caught my eye in the last couple of days was somebody put together some glass node data to estimate that there were over you know that there were 1 million UTXOs with one Bitcoin or over and so somebody who owns a Bitcoin one Bitcoin is a whole coiner right and so there are lots of people trying to stack their sats and get to this one Bitcoin target. And so, you know, there's this claim, right? Okay, there's, we estimate there's a one million whole coiners. And so my kind of immediate thing, well, that's cool. You know, like it's nicely reached their target, but let's go, let's, let's get to 10 million whole coiners. And then it dawns on me that that's probably not possible because, you know, the next nine million people who try to buy Bitcoin will push the price out of reach for them to reach that target, you know, to reach their threshold to get to one million to get to a whole coin of status. And somebody else chimed into this kind of organic thread to say, you know, maybe we're at or very near to peak whole coiners, like the maximum number of people who will ever be able to accumulate a, a single Bitcoin. And I thought that was a pretty interesting kind of a bullish metric. Um, so I thought it was cool. I mean, that's, that's, that's 1 million UTXOs that hold a Bitcoin. Or more, yeah. 
But most people have multiple UTXOs in their wallet. Yeah, it's it's a very loose metric, so it might be plus minus 25% accurate. You know, there are some people who... On the downside, there's, there's probably significantly less than a million whole corners. Well, I mean, it depends on your definition, but there are lots of smaller users who leave their coins on crypto exchanges. And I think you would argue they don't really own a Bitcoin, they own an IOU. Yeah, they're not Bitcoiners. Right. <laughs> so, not your keys, not your coins, but yeah. I think people learned that the hard way this year. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's important not to get caught up on how much Bitcoin you necessarily own. I think, you know, the first sats you stack are the most important, but then after that, you can never have too many, right? right. It's just trying to accumulate as much as possible. That's been my strategy. Jack, I mean, and that's also why I think people will be thinking sats and not Bitcoin. But Jack, I mean, at, at Strike, I think you don't get enough credit that you make it extremely easy for people to self-custody. Uh, you want to talk about how that is a fundamental of the, of the product? Um, sure. I, I mean, I think it's uh, fundamental to the innovation that is Bitcoin um, without the ability to self-custody. It's one of the reasons gold hasn't uh, been as successful as humanity needed it to be. Uh, one of the, the coolest uh, things about Bitcoin, in my opinion, and one of the uh, biggest differences with gold is we built Bitcoin. <laughs> Humans engineered it to be perfect for as far as we've understood money. Gold, we, f we found gold, and we decided that it was the best of all the things we found compared to a shark tooth or to beads in the sand or to precious metals we found. But Bitcoin, we were able to engineer to be digital and bare and so that we can custody it ourselves, which is a tremendous property so that it does not get concentrated with nation states or with any corporation and can get rehypothecated and that the supply and the issuance and the inflation rate and the actual market demand can be configured and misconstrued and manipulated. And so as a company and as a founder that uh, really just wants this thing to work more than anything in the world, um, it was a first principle to us selling it is as soon as you start writing code is if I'm going to sell this thing, um, how quick and how easy can I help people get it off and, and, and get it to their custody? Because um, it, it is one of the most important properties of the instrument. So I don't know, I, I hope customers like that, but as a business and as a founder and as an individual, it was, it was from day one importance, of course. Well, I mean, you, you crunched some numbers on that. I remember we were talking when everything was going to shit. Well, maybe it's still going to shit. But uh, when, when all the banks were failing and we were talking about third-party risk and custodial risk. You crunched some numbers on how much self-custody was done on the platform. Yeah, we, I mean, we have a, a particular type of customer, I would say. So I wouldn't use these numbers generically through the whole industry, but I can, I know my own numbers and I can speak to them. Uh, on the lower bound in a given month, I would say around 80% withdrawal almost immediately after purchase. And then in an upper bound during the FTX situation, we were over 95% as high as immediately withdrawal. So the amount of Bitcoin that we custody on behalf of our customers is minuscule on a ratioed percentage basis than probably a lot of the other crypto shitcoin exchanges. And uh, I think it hopefully says a lot about what we're trying to do and what we're trying to serve to customers. But then I also think it says, uh, who we attract and what we stand for and that uh, I don't I don't know how many customers I share with with F FTX if you had an FTX account you probably didn't like a lot of the things I had to say about them so <laughs> yeah yeah so I mean I think it's another aspect of uh, owning Bitcoin is that potentially coins that you can acquire without any history so coins that you can purchase that nobody knows you own are kind of more valuable, right? Because if somebody doesn't know you own this pocket of coins, then that's your insurance policy. Something that you've bought on an exchange, you know, done wire transfers or debit card payments, there's a big history and everybody knows you have it and they'll sweat you, you know, to hand it over. But if they don't know you have it, that's, that's your insurance policy. And it's, it's relatively difficult to do that, but you know, there are the cash transactions and various loopholes and ways to get modest amounts of Bitcoin with less tracking. So, I think that's an interesting thing to try to do, to try and keep at least a little bit of Bitcoin that has no connectivity into the financial records of the financial system. Damn right.
There's some guides to that effect at nokyconly.com. Um, also, just huge shout out to Peach Bitcoin, Hoddle Hoddle, Bisk, Azteco. These are all different tools that you can use to get no KYC Bitcoin. I think um, people should be aware of the risk of KYC Bitcoin and people should be aware that essentially you're on a list of Bitcoin ownership and how much Bitcoin you own. Um, so thanks for bringing that up, Adam. Um, I'm curious, guys. Um, we have a friend, have a mutual friend, Parker Lewis. He always says gradually, then suddenly. Uh, I want to check my bias a little bit. Some of you might be aware, not this conference, but last conference, I might have said 200K by conference day. <laughs> we didn't get 200K by conference day. Um, but also in 2019, in San Francisco, at Bitcoin 2019, on the roof of that conference, I told everybody there to open their phone and buy some Bitcoin. And we hit a top of 13,500. We didn't breach that top for two and a half years. So I got egg on my face on that one. That was a long time ago. Got egg on my face on 200K by conference day. But I'm constantly, since I've been in Bitcoin, there's FOMOs in the back of my head that at any moment, you can wake up in the morning, there's just a massive green candle, and then the true scarcity of self-custody Bitcoin, of actual Bitcoin, really becomes apparent. Do you guys think of it that way, or is it, am I just a crazy well, person? Well, I mean, if you think about it from a certain point of view, not owning Bitcoin is short, being short Bitcoin. And so being short Bitcoin makes me very scared. So it makes it very hard for me to hold on to any fear whatsoever. And I think that's actually a kind of, you know, and many people get that way. You know, they get more immersed in it, their allocation gets bigger, they start stacking sets, they start cutting back expenses, they start selling things. And um, so, yeah, I, th I think the, you know, being out of Bitcoin is the risk. You know, most people have their portfolio mentality. You know, we don't have the unit of account yet, but we do have the unit of portfolio account or investment account. But most people who get very immersed in it switch to thinking about the portfolio, about how many Bitcoin they have. And so they get pretty calm if the price corrects, you know, 50%, 75%. As long as they've got the same number of Bitcoin, they don't care, right? So you can see that, that mental shift has, has come over. Yeah, I mean, I, like, I think you, the actual question you asked is, do I think of it that way? Um, do yeah. You, do you, like, stay up at night sometimes and you're like, well, I don't uh, have enough Bitcoin. I like like what Adam was saying. Um, I guess I could strip naked on the stage and sell this for some more Bitcoin. I I don't get that nervous, but I no. Who wants um, to see Jack do that? I, <laughs> I no no no. I uh, what I what I wanted to say though is I, I don't think the world knows how to price something that's definitively scarce, that's engineered to have a finite supply. Um, I. There's a, I grew up in, in the Chicago trading markets, I grew up with a phrase that uh, demand finds supply. If gold is going to go up enough, it will get to a price where people are willing to knock the gold out of their mouth to go sell it or rip their house out of the ground to dig under and find new gold bars. The price of gold and the demand of gold actually defines its issuance rate and the supply. If gold is in enough demand, as Elon Musk said, there's probably outer space you can go find more. There are two things that I'm aware of in life that are definitively scarce. Is One, my time on this planet is I will die someday. And that's one of the only things, as of right now, I can absolutely guarantee. And the only other thing is that there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. And so the only thing that I mentally compartmentalize on how to reference how to price this thing is how much I value my life. And it's why I, I take care of my body and it's why I build relationships that I love and it's why I do the things I do. And to try and think about how to then carry that level of energy and finite capability into a monetary instrument I don't know how the world's going to price it and it's going to be complicated and it's going to be volatile and it, sometimes it's going to be war-esque because there are nation states involved. 
But I, I mean, I couldn't be more bullish under that pretense for everything else in your life, guys. You, there will be more supply if there's enough demand. There could be all the demand in the world and nobody can create more Bitcoin in the same way that you can't live forever. And so, yeah, I'm really, really fucking bullish. I don't know how the world's gonna price you. Yeah, that got me going. Time is the only thing more scarce than Bitcoin, period. So. so yeah, I mean, I, I would say about the kind of being nervous about being out. So when I was saying, you know, not being all in Bitcoin feels like that is the risk, right? And so whenever people sell a bit of Bitcoin, like if, if I have some dollars because I've traded something, I'm nervous. Like I wake up in the morning to one of these, you know, 1,000K or 10,000K candles, right? So I'm like super nervous to get back in. And well, effectively, it's statistically the case, right? So people, when they start messing around with trading until they learn not to do that, that... Um, People have done the, looked at the data, and you know, if you take out the 12 biggest, uh, highest gains days in a year, Bitcoin loses money year on year. So what you're really gambling is, if you don't, if you're not all in Bitcoin, that you're going to somehow magically pick the days when this doesn't happen, and the odds are against you. So it's it's dangerous to to you know not be in rather rather than out. Well, well, no, I, and I I agree with that obviously, and I think the other thing I personally, along the analogy of time, is the only thing that I ever exchange my Bitcoin for is if it is an exchange for my time. And that's how I think about trading Bitcoin. I don't think about speculating on the price. I don't, I don't have a Zillow tab open on my laptop. Um, I only think about the only thing as scarce and as valuable to me is my life. And so if I ever need heart surgery or if there's ever anything that's so valuable to my time, that was the only way I would ever exchange sats. Other than that, just based on its definitive scarcity, it's probably a scam. So it's really simple when you put it like that, and it's an easier way to think about it, in my opinion. Damn right. Yeah. I mean, on that note, we are running out of time here. Before we wrap, I wanna thank everyone who made this conference possible. I know you guys, it's very hard to realize what kind of work and effort goes into this. Um, but there are hundreds of people that, that made this, this event possible. There's hundreds of people uh, from our team at Bitcoin Magazine to the camera crew to the audio guys. Everybody around here put so much blood, sweat, and tears to make this event happen. I hope you guys truly enjoyed it. I hope you really appreciated it. I hope you join us back in Nashville next year. I hope you truly appreciate the scarcity of Bitcoin and the scarcity of your time. And I wanna have a huge round of applause for our wonderful guests and these two founders over here. Thank you guys. Bitcoiners, wow, wow, what an event. Thank you so much for joining us here. This is the last time we're going to be coming back to you from Miami at the Bitcoin Magazine Live Desk presented by Marathon. I'm here once again with Adam Swig, PQ. We're here to talk all about this event, all about how bullish we are on Bitcoin and, of course, Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville. Gentlemen. How bullish are you on Bitcoin? Adam, let's start with you. Extremely. I mean, it's impossible to leave this conference not more energized than when you, when you came in. The, the flight down here gets you excited. You don't think you can get any more excited, but you have conversations, uh, scheduled meetings, just bumping into people in the hallways. Uh, more excited than ever, more people building than ever. Super pumped for Music City next year. Amazing. Amazing. Q. I, look, I think you actually meant to say P, but I'll, I'll take it. Um, look, this has been such an incredible experience. Adam, you hit, hit it so perfectly. Coming down here, the excitement to get down here. Frankly, I can't believe I'm still awake. We've been out so much. We've been enjoying ourselves. My voice is starting to actually give out. This has been an incredible conference. After a three-peat in Miami, ready to see what Nashville has in store next year. P. I have never been more excited. I'm going to be honest. When I heard that news, I shat myself. So... Um, <laughs> I've never been more bullish on Bitcoin. I cannot wait to be in Nashville with all of you gentlemen. All right, y'all. So I want to talk a little bit about the panel we just watched. There are some really good one-liners there. Jack Mahler's saying the only thing as scarce or scarcer than Bitcoin in the world is your own life, your own time on this planet. What do y'all think of how do you value 
Bitcoin. It seems to be something that, you know, is it $26,000? Is it 21 mil or infinity to buy by 21 million? What does that even mean, Adam? Back to you. Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, tactically, it's something we struggle a lot with when we're running our forecasts. You know, you run these things in US dollar denominated and so easy to think that way. But every so often we take a step back and say, wait, maybe we should be thinking about this in Bitcoin denominated terms. And I find ourselves thinking more and more that way, uh, which is exciting. And it seems like here it's a, it's a similar sentiment. You know, uh, ultimately, I don't ask the question myself that much. You know, I keep my marathon keeps our heads down, uh, focuses on securing the blockchain. Uh, and the price is just something that uh, a number that pops up every so often. Uh, yeah. How do you value uh, Bitcoin, P? You know, it's interesting. You uh, may have heard the saying, one BTC equals one BTC. And I think that uh, that is absolutely true. I do agree that the only thing more important than Bitcoin is time. Um, yeah, man, couldn't agree more. Q, valuing Bitcoin, how do you do it? I mean, look, I think it's twofold. As Bitcoiners, I think we all kind of agree and find that sentiment of one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin to be true. I I'm not spending my Bitcoin unless it's to make more Bitcoin. However, that's, I think, a conversation amongst Bitcoiners. When you talk to those who don't necessarily have the same belief, have the same sort of gung-ho attitude on Bitcoin, they're still thinking about it in dollar terms. And I think it is important for a company like Marathon to still have that side of it to help those who are still learning about Bitcoin be able to relate, think about it in a way. And over time, they will see and understand why we continue to say one, B one BTC equals one BTC. So this, this is an open question to whoever wants to jump at it, but... How do you explain how bullish you are about Bitcoin to someone who uh, is not orange-pilled? I'll start. I, I think one of the most important things to do when you have these conversations is figure out what they care about. Because we say in Bitcoin, Bitcoin fixes this, Bitcoin fi fixes that, Bitcoin fixes everything. And it is true. You care about the environment, there's, an asset, there's a, a way we can apply Bitcoin with Bitcoin mining to actually help the environment for those people who care about that, for those who care about their family and saving and making sure they leave something behind for their kids. There is an, an avenue for them to understand and value Bitcoin in that way. And the list goes on and on. Businesses that are sick of paying that 2 3% to Visa or, or MasterCard or whoever, guess what? You don't have to pay that fee if you use the Lightning Network and allow your customers to pay in Bitcoin. So it, can, it solves every problem you want. Yeah, couldn't agree more. It's a classic question that comes up on a lot of these conferences, obviously, as you're meeting people, how did you get into the space? And just when I think I've heard all of the answers, there's some common themes, uh, you, you hear a new answer that you didn't expect. And uh, a familiar story or a, uh, something that happened to their family, something that happened, uh, you know, tragic events, happy events brought them to the space. Uh, I'm constantly surprised by uh, the wide variety of reasons people are in the space. And it's really about meeting people where they are. Uh, understanding what is important to them, and Bitcoin usually fits in somehow. Yeah, you know, for me, I think that uh, I tend to approach it from an inflation perspective. When you explain to people the percentage of all the U.S. dollars that have ever existed in the history of this country that have been printed since 1950, since 2008, and you explain to them that basically the government is using inflation to steal from you without making it so obvious, um, that tends to hit home. That was the thing that orange pilled me personally. That's the thing that resonates the most with me. Well, I mean, that narrative in particular has never been really easier to tell. One is the inflation problem. And now, you know, we're seeing huge financial institutions in the legacy system, not just the crypto system, fail. I mean, do you talk about the macro elements? Do you talk about the stability of what is happening today and, and how that's falling apart? I found that uh, screaming as loudly as possible is well, one of the other <laughs> strategies that, use, that I use to uh, effectively orange pill people. I just point at Silvergate, uh, at FTX, at these other explosions that have happened, and I say, that's going to be your life, and your children are going to hate you unless you invest in Bitcoin. That and eating a piece of uh, shoe leather, right? right yes, e? of course. Look, of course. Bitcoiners are anything if not honest hardworking people, and when you make a commitment, um, like uh, a bet, for example, like I made with you, yes. and then you lose that bet um, for reasons that are outside of your control, <laughs> um, then you have to make good on it and eat a shoe, in my case. As but to establish, no one, no one bet you to eat the dog food, right? Uh, no, that was okay. a choice that I made myself to stack sats because I believe in Bitcoin, and clearly you do not. So, <laughs> right, so gentlemen, what, what are you guys even talking about? Uh, on Bitcoin Magazine Live, I was going through some of the strategies that I use personally to effectively stack sats and save more money for my future 
children and family and uh, generations and everything that's important. And one of the strategies that I discussed was eating dog food because it is cheaper than human food. <laughs> um, uh, you know, dog food is grade, uh, uh, grade I think, uh, 4D meat, which is deceased, dying, decrepit, and something else that starts with D, I don't remember. <laughs> the point is, um, we all have different levels of conviction in Bitcoin, and <laughs> you know, some of us are more convicted than others. We're, we're clearly shit coiners because we eat human grade food. <laughs> yeah, no, we, not, not long term preference enough. I need to keep it together. I'm questioning my commitment now. I thought <laughs> yeah. I was pretty committed to this space, but is, I'm having second thoughts. Adam, is Marathon the boy? <laughs> this is not food. a part of the onboarding we, uh, uh, at look, Marathon. CK, this is in, in the handbook. CK, clearly you are not bullish enough, but to go back to what you're bringing up about these financial institutions, we did see earlier this year these collapses. And yes, the price of Bitcoin in the short term collapsed. And then very quickly picked right back up. So we are seeing in real time the use cases and showing, hey, this FDIC insurance that we, we think our money is safe is, in fact, not as safe as we think. And sure, if you're out there watching and you're listening to this and you're like, I can't deal with the volatility. I can't move that much money into Bitcoin. This is going to be, as Greg Foss says, a rounding error. We are less than a year away from the happening. We have seen it time and time again. I'm going to I'm going to put my foot in the sand right now and say the four-year cycle is far from dead. I see Sam Rule giving me a side eye, so I hope I'm right. <laughs> well, hey, you know, I want to actually turn the conversation back to the conference and kind of talk about some of the key themes that we saw here. You know, I honestly was really, really excited by all of the new businesses that are here. It's really kind of incredible to see. Yes, there was that washout that happened after 2022, but there's so much new building that's happening here. A lot of new tech. We even saw a potential replacement for the Lightning Network get announced on the open source stage. What do you all think about some of these themes? Yeah, I've seen a, a lot of super interesting thing. A lot of policy talk, which I thought was awesome to hear from uh, some pretty important people. Last year, I got the sense working the marathon booth, we had a lot of people learning, coming up saying, what do you do? What is mining? Which was great to have so many people learning. This, this time, this go around manning the booth, a lot of people coming up with ideas. You know, have you considered this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about mining with this? Have you thought about going into this country? And so really appreciate that it's, it, it is a building year, which is super exciting. Uh, last piece, I ran into more, uh, uh, you know, non-Bitcoiners, you know, people that self-admitted that they were pro a different cryptocurrency for a, a variety of reasons. Uh, but Bitcoin has caught their attention this year. And so we might be winning, the, winning over some of the uh, uh, doubters, which I'm excited by. P, you want to go next? No. You. <laughs> After you. Uh, look, I think one of the points that you brought up, Adam, is, that is excellent is the fact that we are seeing in real time the global adoption of Bitcoin really happening and picking up and you know all of us are here in the US in Miami we have the privilege of having the global reserve currency but just as a gentle reminder to you all the BRICS nations for the first time ever their combined GDP has now surpassed the the US and the G7 countries GDP the BRICS nations are now also talking about creating their own currency to essentially finalize international trade for themselves a quick little note for you Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin and all you other uh, leaders of those BRICS nations Bitcoin does exactly that, and you don't need to trust each other. So I know Vladimir Putin is out there watching intently right now. I'm, go for it, Pete. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if you've read the, um, the future documentary uh, by Lionel Shriver, The Mandibles, but I think we are headed, unfortunately, in that direction, which is to say a group of countries establishing their own currency to get around and uh, circumvent the U.S. dollar. And I think, of course, Bitcoin is the only thing that... Uh, a reasonable person can do in order to protect oneself and one's family from that kind of outcome. I mean, I, I fully agree with that. I'm a huge fan of the book, The Mandibles. Shout out to Odell for popularizing it. I wish that Lionel Shriver could have come here and signed books. We're going to work on bringing her to Nashville at Bitcoin 2024. But one of the key elements of that book, which is not mapped to reality is that Bitcoin doesn't exist in that book. Well, actually, and she says Bitcoin fails in that book. So there you go. In that world, Bitcoin uh. doesn't exist. And we're living in a world where Bitcoin does exist. And I think that that's the difference. I don't think that the BRICS nations are going to actually be able to come up with an alternative currency that works. The alternative currency that will be adopted eventually after the dollar is Bitcoin. Uh, interesting. You're saying the optimistic take that we are in the best of all possible worlds because of Bitcoin, we're not in the pessimistic world where we're all going to have to be eating dog food. Yeah, I mean, the dog food might be optional. <laughs> it's definitely optional. I need to rethink some things. <laughs> I will talk to you about this afterwards. Adam, do you think, I mean, waving into, you know, geopolitics, you know, there's been a lot of narratives about 
the de-dollarization, uh, the rise of these alternative currencies, do you think there's going to be another fiat currency that becomes the gold reserve before Bitcoin? You know, it's, it's, it's hard uh, to coordinate and trust one another and, and to get something like that built. And I think that's, I mean, the miracle of Bitcoin and why proof of work and all of this, uh, why we're all here today is uh, Bitcoin was able to solve a lot of those problems. Uh, a lot of the problems are caused by people. People run countries, uh, and that's why I like to believe in the code. So uh, I think people will try. I think they'll struggle, and hopefully they find their way back to Bitcoin. I think they will, honestly. I really do think they will. Uh, one of the ways that I explain Bitcoin to people that aren't Bitcoiners, haven't been orange-pilled, is I simply say, Bitcoin's money that actually works. Your money sucks. It's broken. We know that. That's a fact. It's not disputable at this point, and Bitcoin works. It's a fixed supply. It's permissionless. Can't be censored. It works. And guess what? Shout out to my man, Nolan. You can count it, too. So that's the important part. You can count your Bitcoin. You don't know how many dollars there are, but you know exactly how many Bitcoins there are. Love it. Well said. So uh, jumping over to, you know, there was a lot of talk about, hey, there are negative, a lot of negative sentiment about Bitcoin. That's almost like the default sentiment, right? And there's a lot of excuses, energy usage, volatility, all of these different kind of reasons why not Bitcoin. But I think that a lot of those narratives are kind of falling apart, especially as we see volatility in fiat, volatility in the dollar pick up. When are we going to start saying the dollar is too volatile? Q. They have numbed us to this idea of inflation. The idea that, oh, inflation is transitory. Actually, you know, it, it, it may not be. Oh, you know, inflation is a little sticky. Slowly and steadily, they're getting us used to the idea that inflation is, is okay and acceptable. And not just the 2% inflation that we've lived with since the 70s. I'm talking about 5 6% inflation very consistently. That is volatile for a currency that you are meant and supposed to be able to save. Just think. With the exception of P, all of us have 401ks that we cannot access because P is the ageless wonder. Could you imagine putting money aside in a 401k that for 30, 40 years, you don't know what the dollar is actually going to be worth? How can you actually safely say, hey, this is how I want to save my money. This is how I'm going to be able to provide for myself at an age where I don't want to work or when I want to be able to help my kids get through anything, college or whatnot. Bitcoin is the solution. Bitcoin is the only option that we have. And unfortunately, there's a lot of rhetoric that pushes against this idea? The, the current environment, I think, is causing a lot of people to question how things work and, and learn about it. I mean, for the long, I, I, I was taught inflation in some high school class. I had to memorize the definition, but I didn't internalize what it meant. Similar, that FDIC insurance, I had to memorize that definition and take some tests on it, but I didn't really understand what it meant. It's not until these things happen where people really start to question, wait, this is actually impacting my life, and these just aren't textbooks in some economics class I had to take uh, however many years ago. Uh, and so I think it's going to bring more people into the community, and it's, it's a lot of learning. This is complex stuff. If you take a step back, it's remarkable uh, that this financial system is held together uh, the way it is with glue and tape. And so, uh, you know, all, all better that Bitcoin step up and people are... Uh, realizing the problems that exist out there and how Bitcoin solves a lot of those in a simple, elegant way. So I want to jump over to another theme that has really been important in the Bitcoin you know, conversation leading up to the conference. Uh, and it's made the conference a topic of conversation because we are willing to have a conversation about it here. And that is this idea of ordinals and other items on top of Bitcoin. Obviously, that's something that uh, it's still, there's not a lot of consensus around it. There's still a lot of hurt feelings about what is happening on chain. There's even some uh, regret on previous upgrades like Segwit and Taproot because of it. You know, to say that this is striking to the core of Bitcoiners is, you know, I think an, an understatement. But gentlemen, I mean, P, let's start with you. What's your thought on the conversation that happened around uh, ordinals leading up to where we are now? And what is the consensus right now amongst the Bitcoin community? Yeah, absolutely. I think there is not consensus. I think, as you said, there is a lot of conflict. I think that my personal opinion is that people should be able to do whatever the fuck they want with their Bitcoin. And if they want to spend that Bitcoin on things that I think are completely frivolous and uh, highly regarded, then they can. And that just increases the security of the Bitcoin network. I think that, um, yeah, that's basically all it comes down to for me personally. Uh, I am more for experimentation and trying. That is the story of cryptocurrency. That is the story of Bitcoin. Is the reason I love working, living, and, and learning about this space. There have been many, many projects in this space that have been tried and failed. There have been many, many that have tried and succeeded. More power towards this experiment. 
Uh, I think it's novel. I think within the marathon team, we're still learning about it, and there's disagreement within the marathon team. But that's, that's why we're here, is to try new things and talk about it, talk about the pros and cons. And next year, we're going to be talking about something else. It might still be this. It might be something completely different. Uh, but experimentation and pushing the boundaries is what it's all about. Before we, before we uh, move on, I, I want to talk to you a little bit. You know, obviously, fees on the Bitcoin mining network have been going up you know, significantly. Um, and I'm sure that is really positively affecting things over at Marathon. I'm kind of curious, how are you forecasting maybe what the future of fees looks like as you know this new paradigm is unleashed? It's a, it's a great question. It, I got to say it was a crazy couple of days. We, the Marathon team, you can sign up to get a text message every time we win a block. And so the team, oh, it's kind of great when you all sit in the same room with a team of marathoners and everybody's phone buzzes at the same time. You know, you just want to block. Yes. Uh, and there was, like I said, there was a few days where you're looking at your phone, you were seeing the fees and we had to call the tech team and say, I think there's a bug in these texts because <laughs> this decimal point is in the wrong spot when it came to the fees that we just won per block. So definitely insane. Uh, you know, right now with the happening approaching, we're taking a more conservative approach. You know, the fees are kind of gravy at this stage. Uh, you know, it seems like they're stabilizing. So looking at the numbers, perhaps something we start to forecast in. Uh, but at this point, all upside. I think it's important to maintain a lot of optionality as a miner as you go into the happening. Uh, the only known is that there's a ton of unknowns. Uh, so as of now, forecasting a wide variety of possible scenarios, uh, halving, fees, uh, all the above. All right, before we transition to the halving, I want to give either P or Q or both a chance to respond one last thought on ordinals. I, I would like to just chime in and say, as a free market maximalist, I do agree. Everyone should be able to spend their Bitcoin however they want. Very directly, though, this idea that test running these things and doing this, it, it's a help to the network is, quite frankly, in my opinion, laughable. Um, we have a privilege that we are able to do these things, that we're able to send JPEGs over the blockchain. At the same time, there are people who desperately need a form of currency because their country is going through hyperinflation. Just look at Argentina, for example, or Iran, not having any sense of a stable currency. These places need Bitcoin. Iran, another example of a country that needs to settle international trade outside of the dollar network. But here we are sending Pepe's and JPEGs over it because we have a privilege of living in the dollar system. There's one other thing I'd like to say, which is that um, I agree with you, first of all. And also, the thing that I do have a problem with is people that are making spurious claims about ordinals and what they are and what they signify and Things like that. There are certain people uh, who are claiming things like, we broke Bitcoin, which is totally bullshit and not true. No, absolutely true. You're, you're, and I'm sorry, you're absolutely correct. They did not break Bitcoin. I'm sorry, I misspoke there. I was about to say, how dare you? <laughs> uh, Bitcoin will never die, Pete. Yeah, exactly. So that kind of shit, I'm just like, come on. It's just people grifting. And I think there's a lot of that right now in the space. A lot of people who are just in the shitcoin world, they're moving over into um, uh, the ordinal space because they see it as a way to affinity scam. And make a quick buck. I mean, there's a lot of quick bucks to be made if you can print something out of thin air, obviously. So, you know, that's true when it comes to NFTs. That's true when it comes to ordinals. That's true when it comes to, uh, you know, other tokens and even fiat money. That's kind of the whole point of Bitcoin is it shows the contrast between finite supply and pretty much everything else which can be printed. I want to switch over to talk about the halving. Obviously, the halving is coming next year. It's going to be a huge theme for Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville. I'm kind of curious, what are y'all's anticipation of the halving, and are you excited? Let's start with you, Adam. Uh, super excited. Obviously, going to have a major impact uh, as a publicly traded miner. I think, like I said, important to recognize that we don't know what's going to happen. Important to be prepared for anything that could happen. Uh, and that's part of the excitement is operating in the unknown uh, when you don't know what's going to happen to your revenue. I w if I did know what was going to happen post happening or post what's going to happen price afterwards, I'd be on some private island somewhere. But instead, I'm uh, here trying to figure it out with the rest of you. No, you and I are going to Vegas if you ever figure that out. <laughs> Gentlemen, you want to go first? Please. I am extremely excited. I think that the having is going to have a similar effect that it always has. It's going to create a supply shock, and that is going to drive up the price of Bitcoin. I am planning to sell one of my kidneys for Bitcoin, and I'm very confident that it's going to be a fantastic investment. I think That's the dog food polluted kidneys trade for a little less. <laughs> You'd think that. They actually go for more. Ah. <laughs> it's a collector's item. Um, Look, you both are absolutely right. As far as a, from a Bitcoiner's perspective, I think we are prepared and, and have a solid expectation. But there's another side of this too, where 
those who are not involved in this space, those who are the tourists who come in during the bull markets, who maybe pay attention to Bitcoin when it's hitting an all-time high, they saw it in 2017. They saw it again, what was it, last two years ago in 2021. And as the happening happens again, and you start to see the consistency of this, do it one time, okay, maybe. Do it twice, maybe there's a fluke. Do it three times, a lot more questions are going to be asked by normies, and I think you're going to see adoption really pick up. Bitcoin has not stepped away from being in the financial news on a regular basis. It's t discussed and talked about as often as the S&P 500, other index indices, as well as bonds when you look at financial news programs. If Bitcoin has a nice, big, new all-time high during this four-year cycle, you are going to see more normies start to pay attention to Bitcoin, and it's going to get buck wild. I mean, that's that's what history has shown is that's what happens. You know, uh, the the having happens. And then within, you know, a year around a year of time, we have all time highs and a lot of euphoria. Um, I am hopeful that that is going to continue just because I'm scared for things to change. You know, <laughs> I want the having to continue to matter and I want this four year cycle to continue to drive adoption forward. Will that change in Bitcoin? It's been something that people have speculated for a long time. Super cycle. Bitcoin no longer have or the having having less of of a effect. But let's go with you. What do you think? Uh, you know, it does seem you know the magnitude of happenings are, are are compressing. I understand, but that. Uh, but on the other side, I think the magnitude of people learning about this, it is, it's, a, it's infectious, it's a virus. It spreads quicker. The more people learn about it, the, the quicker it spreads. Uh, so I think the magnitude of people learning is going to trump everything that combined with the supply shock, even though it's a smaller magnitude of supply shock. E. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I think that um, the faster this spreads, the faster this spreads. I think that, you know, this is the first... Bitcoin conference where there's been not one, not two, but three presidential hopefuls speaking about it. I think that's extremely significant. And I think that any um, decreases in the, uh, the rate of adoption or the, the, the price because people start to understand the mechanics behind the happening um, is going to be outweighed by the rapid increases in adoption. Thank you. I mean, ultimately what we're gonna see is an opportunity for us as Bitcoiners to be building both technology, use cases for Bitcoin, as well as just ways to explain Bitcoin so that when the time comes when all of your friends who've been laughing for the last couple of years, all the family members who are really mad that you told them to buy Bitcoin above 50K, I'm really sorry about that, mom. Just keep holding, trust me on that. Um, you know, this is our opportunity to learn, to be prepared, because when it comes, when that time happens, there will come a moment, candidly, where this four-year cycle has to stop because everyone is adopting Bitcoin all at the same time. The game theory will play out. And it is happening slowly and steadily. Slowly and then suddenly. When hockey stick? When hyper-Bitcoinization? Like I said, man, whoever knows, just let me know, and I'm buying us flights to Vegas. P. No fucking clue. I thought oh, I knew Let's it. get a forecast. Come on. All right. Let's let's it's going to be here. 2025. 2025? Wow. Yep. Hockey man. stick. Million, a million per Bitcoin. Brains are going to break. Guaranteed. <laughs> You heard it here first. Yeah, I mean, similar. I mean, a little more conservative approach here in terms of planning for a public company. But I think we're, we're prepared for maybe a rough post happening and things shake out. But those believers that survive those rough one to six months are going to be heavily rewarded. All right, y'all. I would be remiss if we didn't talk about Nashville a little bit. All of us have been to Nashville. P and I live there. I love the city. I'm so excited to have the conference there. Uh, the venue is right on uh, Broadway. So... Perfect, perfect place to have this event so that way you can go and party and explore and enjoy country music in the home of country music. Y'all, what gets you most excited about Nashville? Let's start with you, Q. Um, because two of my homies live there. <laughs> like, which one of you is letting me sleep on your couch? <laughs> uh, this hey, guy. guest bed. I got you, my man. Yes, <sighs> yes. But no, in all seriousness, Nashville is such a fun place. Uh, I've ha always had a great time going. I'm excited for 2024 20 to be in Nashville post having too. That's going to just be a great theme to be able to discuss there. And then, of course, it is the home of Bitcoin Magazine. So we're on your home turf, guys. You and Bitcoin Park and soon to be many more Bitcoiners. P. Yeah, I, I couldn't be more excited. I think Nashville is an incredible city, uh, incredible group of people. Everybody is so kind. And I'm excited specifically to have this event there because it will bring Bitcoin to so many more people than even an event like this does because it's not physically in Nashville. So selfishly, I am extremely excited for everyone that is in Nashville to get orange-pilled even faster because I love the city. 
Hey, the, the color of Tennessee is orange. Go Vols. Adam, what's your last word? I like that. No, similar. I spent a lot of time in my former life. I was like a digital healthcare investor. A lot of that going on in Nashville, one of the things it's known for. But I look forward to rebranding it from Music City to BTC City uh, by next summer. Bitcoin City USA. Y'all, that is all we have for you here on the Bitcoin Magazine Live Desk at Bitcoin 2023. I want to say a sincere, sincere thank you to you, Adam, and to all the good folks at Marathon for helping us make this possible. I want to thank everyone who tuned in all three, all three days. I want to thank everyone who was a part of this event and especially those who attended. You are the real legends. Make sure to smash like, make sure to subscribe, and make sure to get your Bitcoin 2024 ticket. Right now, prices are going to be going up steadily throughout the year. So this is the best time to buy. Do it today. Bye.